वेलकम थैंक यू फॉर ट्यूनिंग इन आई एम मेहर झा फ्रॉम द पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश एस के एम यूनिवर्सिटी तुमका टूडेज लेक्चर इज गोइंग टू बी अबाउट वुदरिंग हाइट्स इन टूडेज लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट द प्लॉट ऑफ द नॉवल द कैरेक्टराइजेशन इन द नॉवल एज वेल एज द नेरेटिव स्ट्रक्चर इन द नॉवल इफ वी थिंक इफ यू टॉक अबाउट वेरी इफ यू वेरी ब्रीफली टॉक अबाउट द नॉवल then uh, we see that wuthering heights is a very complex very unconventional kind of love story and it is not your airy fairy love story in any in any way uh, the characters they the principal characters are heathcliff and catherine and even even if we see that they are immensely in love with each other but we also see that they are not married they are married to other people they are not they are not together Uh, it is also a novel which draws heavily from the landscape in which the action and the story takes place and while doing so the novel also comments on victorian morality what is acceptable what is not acceptable what kind of love is given a space in the society what kind of love is looked down upon uh, we also see how love operates across various characters various pairs and couples and usually love is associated with the idea of marriage and uh, it is assumed that one leads to the other uh, but here we see that love and marriage can exist very differently very separately from each other and uh, <coughs> uh, and and we see that there are many couples and married uh, pairs in the novel uh, who are married for the sake of marriage but they do not necessarily love their spouse uh, the novel begins with a person coming into a very desolate part of uh, the country uh, the person is mr lockwood he is a tenant uh, at this place called thrush cross grange and thrush cross grange is owned by a very mysterious person called heathcliff mr heathcliff uh, mr heathcliff lives in uh, this big mansion called wuthering heights and wuthering heights uh, by the very looks of it uh, betrays the gothicness within its architecture uh, the mansion is not properly kept it has overgrown grass uh, <clears throat> it it has a very dark feeling attached to it and emily bronte as a novelist she leaves no stones unturned to actually bring out that effect of darkness as lockwood enters through the gates of the heights and we see that every kind of assumption that we have about hospitality about how people should talk to each other about mm-hmm. Uh, something as simple as being cordial to each other all of these assumptions are turned on their heads when lockwood meets mr heathcliff for the first time uh, he of course according to mr heathcliff is uh, and and according to himself also he is an unannounced visitor and while it is conventional it is it is acceptable practice to even welcome an unannounced visitor with happiness into your home we see from the very beginning of the novel that lockwood is not welcome in tobring heights and that that feeling of not being welcome into this grand mansion is actually accentuated by lockwood's encounter with catherine's ghost uh, <coughs> which makes him uh, run away from the heights uh, when we look at how the novel progresses we see that lockwood comes back to thrush cross grange and asks the caretaker of the grange to tell him something about who mr heathcliff is what is the deal behind that very mysterious mansion wuthering heights what happens inside of there who are the people who are living there and when mrs dean the caretaker of the house variously also called ellen nelly 
when she begins to tell Lockwood the story of Wuthering Heights, then our novel starts. The story of the mansion and the people who are living in the mansion is that of the Earnshaw family. The Earnshaw family is, 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 is composed of father, the mother, uh, a son and a daughter. The son is Hindley, the daughter is Catherine, and then there are Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw. Hindley is the elder brother of Catherine, uh, and Catherine is uh, the youngest uh, member of the house, and therefore also uh, spoiled a bit. Throughout the novel, we see that Catherine has been described as wild, that her character exists in a kind of excess which is very hard to contain according to or by the principles of Victorian morality. And this wildness of Catherine uh, corresponds very nicely with the wildness and the wilderness of the moors and of the landscape which surrounds Wuthering Heights. Uh, <coughs> Heathcliff enters into Wuthering Heights as, as a child who has been picked up by Mr. Earnshaw as a gift for his daughter Catherine. And Catherine had originally asked for a whip for her horse. The whip was broken and instead what she got in return was Heathcliff. Uh, critics have viewed this as Catherine's desire for control. And finally, instead of getting a whip, getting a real man, a real person in her life. Heathcliff stays on in Wuthering Heights despite initial protests from the people who are living there. And Heathcliff by his very appearance and by the lack of any lineage uh, is marked external to the family, is an outsider to the family, is an other to the family. He is a black, in, uh, black person in color. His whereabouts are not really known. Uh, no one knows who his father or his mother were. All that is known of Heathcliff is that he was found by Mr. Earnshaw in Liverpool and then he was brought home to Wuthering Heights where Heathcliff begins his journey. Catherine and Heathcliff take to each other very, very immediately, instantly. They are like very similar to each other. Both are external to certain definitions of accepted normalcy. Heathcliff is not a white person. Heathcliff does not have a family heritage or a family name. Heathcliff is by default an outsider to the English society. Catherine, on the other hand, uh, even though she is a white person, even though she is very much an English woman, but still the way she behaves, it goes against the grains of morality, which at that time was prevalent. And we have many instances of people telling Catherine not to be wild. We have many instances of people trying to restrain Catherine. But just like you cannot restrain the wild landscape, no one could restrain Catherine also. And the same thing goes for Heathcliff too. One of the very prominent markers, one of the very prominent symbols that depict the mental state, that depict this, this kind of, you know, this kind of difference, this kind of difference from the accepted codes of behavior, this kind of difference from what is considered good behavior. So one of the very major and prominent symbols that Emily Bronte uses is that symbol of the landscape. And there both Catherine and Heathcliff find resonance. Catherine and Heathcliff are inseparable. They, they have lived their life together ever since Heathcliff was brought in home and till Catherine's wedding. And 
through their growing up years, we see that Heathcliff, even though he spoke very less, he did possess a cunning mind. He did know when to say what and what to say and to whom to say. Like we see that Heathcliff, even with his sparse words and dialogues, is able to terrorize Hindley by just saying that I am going to tell your father. Right? That is the kind of effect that Heathcliff has on Mr. Earnshaw, who is very sympathetic towards him, who, it wouldn't be wrong to say, who loves him also to some extent, and who believes Heathcliff's word as truth. Right? So Heathcliff is aware of his power in the house, even while being an outsider to the house, an outsider to the family, something extra to the family, even then he holds very, very much power over Mr. Earnshaw and over the family in general. Similarly, we see that Catherine also exercises her power through her tantrums, through her many erratic behavior. And we are led to believe in the novel by Emily Bronte that these two characters are perhaps meant for each other, that their souls are one. That is the argument of the novel. That Heathcliff, as I was saying before, that the argument regarding love in the novel, in the context of these two characters, Catherine and Heathcliff, is that they share something very fundamental between themselves. Sometimes they say that the soul resides in the other person, that the other person is their soul. Uh, in the kitchen scene where Catherine is speaking with Nelly, Mrs. Dean, the narrator of the novel, uh, in, in the kitchen scene we see that uh, Catherine tells Nelly that Heathcliff is more Catherine-ish than Catherine himself, herself is. And similarly, elsewhere in the novel too, we see Heathcliff referring to Catherine as his soul. And it is surprising, therefore, that they are not together, that they are not married. Marriage in the novel works in, in coherence with the popular ideas of how or what or who a person should marry or how a person should marry and for what reasons a person should marry. Uh, in the kitchen scene only, we see that Catherine tells Nelly that she, she wants to marry Edgar not because she loves him but because it is the most prudent thing to do. Similarly, Heathcliff marries Edgar's sister, Isabella, not because he loves her but it's the most prudent thing to do in order to achieve his own goals. Similarly, we see that even though, uh, not similarly, but uh, very interestingly, that even though their, both these houses, Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grants, they, they share an aversion towards each other, but characters in the novel, they cannot help getting married into one of these houses. So, people living in Wuthering Heights and people living in Thrushcross Grants they end up getting married into the other place, into the other house. Despite their uh, dislike for the house, despite their dislike for these two families, they used to be the Earnshaws and the Lintons, they used to be on good terms before, but gradually both the houses, they, they grew apart, they started being skeptical of each other, and despite all of this, characters in the novel, they end up getting married into these two homes. So Catherine from Wuthering Heights ends up at Thrushcross Grounds, 
Isabella from Thrasprus Grange ends up at Wuthering Heights. Then Cathy from Thrasprus Grange ends up at Wuthering Heights. Linton, the son of Isabella and Heathcliff, who, who perhaps was conceived or perhaps was, uh, was perhaps conceived at uh, Wuthering Heights, he returns to Thrascross Grange. Uh, and, and these kind of things keep happening. Nellie Dean is one prominent character who keeps going to and fro between these two houses. Right? So in a way, it's a very tightly knitted community. It's a very tightly knitted assembly of characters whose, it seems that whose entire lives depend on these two homes, on the journeys that they take to and from these two homes, right? Nellie Dean is a very interesting figure. She is the principal narrator of the novel, even though she is not the main narrator of the novel. The main narrator of the novel is Mr. Lockwood. Mr. Lockwood's narrative contains the narrative of Nellie Dean's. Right? So, there are two levels on which the story is being told in the novel. Nellie Dean is interesting because she has access to both the homes. And she has lived enough in that area to know and to experience firsthand things that have happened, both at Wuthering Heights and at Thrush Cross Crunch. However, we cannot assume Nellie Dean to be innocent. Whatever story that she tells Lockwood, whether it is about Heathcliff, whether it is about Catherine, or whether it is about any other character or any other event, we need to understand that Nellie Dean, after all, is a human being. And human beings operate out of certain biases and certain prejudices. And that the version of the story which Nellie Dean is telling Lockwood is in the end only a version of the story, right? That's why I use this word, version. It is not the absolute story. It is the story of these two people, Catherine and Heathcliff, told from Nellie's point of view. We see in the novel that Nellie comes across as your typical Victorian woman. She is representative of the contemporary consciousness during the Victorian period. And it is through Nellie Dean that we, try, we get to understand that what the society at that time used to prefer and what the society at that time used to, you know, used to look down upon. Uh, Nellie is very, uh, very candid, sometimes unnervingly so. Sometimes it seems that Nellie is purposefully spilling the beans. She is purposefully divulging many sensitive details to an outsider, to Lockwood, who has just only recently come into the country, right? And this should make us think that what is the purpose behind being so candid, so open with someone whom you have known only for a few days. But Nellie is very open, she is very candid, she does not hold information back, at least the novel does not give that kind of an impression. But through Nellie we understand the currents of the society. It is through Nellie's judgment on various characters. She, she of course does not like Catherine being so unrestrained, Catherine being so wild, to use the word again. But she does like Catherine's daughter, Cathy. Because while Cathy's mother was an excess to Victorian morality, her daughter Cathy fits nicely into the, in the mold which is, which is expected out of a well-behaved, petite, Victorian woman. Similarly, we see that Nellie Dean does not approve of the relationship between 
Heathcliff and Catherine either, even though she does go on to tell the story, but we, we see that Nellie is more sympathetic towards Edgar. We see that Nellie understands that Edgar is in a very unfortunate situation where he is married to a woman who probably does not love him, even though how much he may love her. And we also see Nelly being present in almost all crucial events that happen in the book so that she could summarize those events for the story, for the purpose of the story that she is telling to Lockwood. I am not going to give you a very nice summary of the novel. If you are thinking that this video will give you a summary of the novel, then it is not going to be like that. I would prefer if you read the text first and then watch this video. When we talk about the narrative structure of the novel, we have, we have, I have told before that the novel operates on two narrative levels. The first is that of Lockwood, the other is that of Nelly Dean. And that Lockwood is the containment narrator. Lockwood is the principal narrator within which the narration of Nelly takes place. But it is interesting because when we are reading the novel, there are so many times there are so many instances where we tend to forget that we are actually inside, we are actually inside Lockwood's narration because Nellie's narration takes so much precedence. It takes so much, it is so significant, it is so filled with details and everything, details and stories and twists and turns that sometimes we tend to forget that it is not Nelly who is telling us the story, it is Lockwood who is telling us the story which is being told to him by Nelly. Right? <clears throat> if we look at how people meet their future in this novel, even then we see that besides Isabella who managed to get out of Thrushcross Grange and go to London and besides Heathcliff who for a brief period of time for three years was away from the was away from that place uh, all the characters somehow or the other are fixed to this area uh, in and around Gimmerton right they don't go out, they don't move out, they are there, they live there, they grow there, they grow up there, they die there, right? So this kind of movement we see that is not happening. It is as if all these characters are grounded in, in the harshest way possible to the land that they call home, right? To buildings that they call home. And even though the land, the mansions, and the overall gothic environment which the novel creates for us, even though it makes living tough for these people, we see that there is no outward movement from this area. Lockwood once again is also very interesting, besides Melody. He introduces himself as a recluse, but does the exact opposite thing by going to meet Heathcliff. Uh, he seems more to be in love with the idea of being a recluse than properly actually being a recluse. Right? And in Lockwood we sense this sense of hypocrisy, this sense of self-importance, and a little bit of foolishness also. He, he is that, uh, uh, he is that uh, idiot in an endearing sort of way. 
that you you look at you read whatever lockwood has to say you listen to what lockwood is saying and you can't help but smile at at the very innocent idiocy of it all <clears throat> when we come to the question of what happens towards the end of the novel well what happens towards the end of the novel is 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 that without giving out any major spoilers uh, is that uh, they uh, is that heathcliff and catherine are in a way united and how they are united that i am going to leave out but they are united in the end and there is another layer to their union and that layer is that union between thrushcross branch and wuthering heights which happens towards the end of the novel catherine's daughter cathy is initially first married to heathcliff's son linton and after linton dies she she becomes this reserved old person but by the end of the novel we see her becoming gentler towards hertan the son of hindley right and the novel ends with this suggestion that there might be a future between the two of them throughout the novel we see that these two homes the heights and the grant they are in the state of perpetual conflict and reconciliation conflict and reconciliation conflict and reconciliation this keeps on happening the first time that heathcliff and catherine enter thrushcross grange when they are kids heathcliff is not allowed into the grange because of his features because of uh, because of because of his his appearance because of his ungentle man like man right so heathcliff comes back and catherine returns a day later with the people in the grange that first instance of catherine's acceptance into the grange and when the family the lintons come to wuthering heights to drop catherine off we see that this initial uh this initial solidarity between the two houses this initial uh, feeling of uh, duty which neighbors feel towards each other soon turns into something very uh, negative uh, <coughs> similarly when catherine is married to edgar and goes to fresh cross branch and when heathcliff returns then again the relationship between the two houses becomes complicated heathcliff returns for the purpose of taking revenge uh, taking revenge for all the injustices that were done to him when he was young injustice is meted out to him by hindley so he slowly and steadily begins to influence hindley towards his own destruction in order to take possession of wuthering heights and he schemes his actions in such a way that by the end of the novel we see that he also owns thrushcross grange so through his quiet cunning and through his intense love for catherine heathcliff somehow is able to rise from the position of that of almost a servant in wuthering heights in the beginning to that of the master of not only wuthering heights but also thrushcross town thank you for watching this video I hope that it was able to clear some of your doubts. Uh, I also hope that you are reading the text. 
and that uh, we will soon see each other at the end of this tough period. Uh, thanks for tuning in.